All right, I hope you all are enjoying the Star Trek convention. Thank you for the giggles. Um, actually, I got in on Saturday night and staying at the Double Tree, I noticed there is a, or was a Halloween convention. Did anyone see the Halloween convention? I asked them at reception about it, and uh, apparently they were celebrating Friday the 13th, so that's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, this is uh, RailsCon, and we're here to talk about queuing theory. Um, this is my first live in person on stage talk, so again, super nervous. Wow, thank you. Um, I'm Justin Bowen. I go by Tons of Fun on the GitHub, Tons of Fun 111 on Twitter. I'm a CTO consultant at SESG, Silicon Valley Software Group, where we help uh, early stage to large later stage startups, as well as enterprises with their scaling problems, whether that's technical or human scaling issues. Uh, I've also started uh, as the Director of Engineering at Insight Surgical AI, where we are delivering real-time computer vision uh, of surgical objects in operating rooms for patient safety. So it's pretty cool. So Q, Q who? What does Star Trek have to do with the Q? Well, Star Trek personally, uh, was a big inspiration for me, watching LeVar Burton as Geordi LaForge, uh, Chief O'Brien, really inspired me to want to become a software engineer uh, or an engineer, though I've been told not to say that unless you have an engineering degree, which I don't, so. Um, yeah, anyway, let's make it so and uh, start talking about uh, the Q. So we're going to be talking about transporters. And Chief O'Brien was the uh, transport operator for transporter room three on the Enterprise, his favorite transporter room. If you watch Deep Space Nine, he also really liked transporter pad C. Uh, if you watch the original series, you're familiar, or you might just be familiar with the phrase, beam me up, Scotty. O'Brien is not Scotty but uh, he is Irish, not Scottish, but, you know. Uh, so the Q are an extra dimensional being and uh, society that uh, are introduced to us in TNG. Uh, at the beginning of the series, Q is challenging Picard and giving him a run for his money in terms of whether he thinks humans should be exploring the galaxy. Uh, the Q are uh, able to manipulate time and space, and they are known as the Q continuum. The place they're from is the Q continuum. And what we're gonna be talking about is transporters and capacity planning, and how do transporters have anything to do with Qs? Well, the USS Enterprise in The Next Generation had a crew complement of about a thousand. I think the original series Constellation class Enterprise had around 300. So this is a galaxy class starship. And the way a transporter room, like we saw with Chief O'Brien, uh, is designated on a starship and the way they decide how many transporter rooms that they're going to have is based on how many beam outs they can do in a certain amount of time to evacuate the ship or station. So if we were Q, we could just snap our fingers and everyone could be beamed to safety. Uh, he could beam an entire colony off of the planet. In one episode, he actually launched the Enterprise onto the other side of the galaxy. Spoiler alert, I know it's been like 30 years. That's how they introduced the Borg. But as humans, uh, Riker had the ability to have the power of the Q. But as humans, we have to queue. Queuing really just means waiting. 
Uh, so waiting in line is something that we're all familiar with. We waited in line to get our badges here. Uh, I waited in line at the airport. Uh, some of the terms that we'll be talking about are queues. The unit of work is the job or request or you know, service that needs to be performed. Uh, the servers, or in this case, transporters, uh, and the service time. And in this case, how long does it take to beam out? Uh, so a transporter uh, can, in this uh, depiction, transport out six people at a time. And the beam out time is about five seconds. So in order to get all of the crewmen out in two minutes, that would mean we have 500 crewmen beamed out per minute, or about 8.3 per second. So if we have uh, 8.3 per second, how do we know uh, what the rate of transport is and what the offered traffic is? Well, there's this thing called Little's Law. And Little's Law really just says, uh, based on the service time and the rate of traffic, we can determine the offered traffic. So in our case, with 8.3 uh, beam outs per second, or people needing to be beamed out per second, and it taking five seconds, we have an offered traffic of 41.5. So it is the time it takes to process the work multiplied by the average rate of arrival. So with 41.5 beam outs and it taking five seconds, as you just saw there, we're gonna need more than just one transporter to get everyone out to safety in time. And so in this uh, scenario of having 41 and a half crew members to beam out per second, we're gonna have to think about that offered traffic and how we actually service that traffic. So again, service time times the rate of jobs gives us our offered traffic. So in this scenario, uh, if we're on the enterprise and we have one transporter, uh, it would take us quite a while to process through a thousand crew members. But how do we know how long that's going to take? Well, we could just scale up and add more transporters and see, measure, benchmark how long it took. But there are some other tools that we can use uh, in the toolkit of queuing theory. Uh, and one of the interesting things that I uh, discovered in my reading was something called the use method that was originally uh, put together by Brendan Gregg, who uh, is now at Intel. And the use stands for utilization, which is the services used divided by the services available, and saturation, which is basically when resource consumption is overloaded, and errors, which is just wasted resources. So if you are processing jobs and they're creating errors, that's preventing other jobs from being successful. So we can describe utilization as the offered traffic divided by parallelism. So parallelism. Uh, so in this case, if we have 41 and a half offered traffic, what's the parallelism required to beam off 1,000 crew members? Well, with a single transporter, just a single transporter pad, not a full, you know, six, that's going to be like 100,000% uh, utilization. So we're going to have saturation. We're over 100%. Uh, so people are going to have to wait. And waiting sucks, but especially in an emergency situation. This is the same with rooms for capacity planning. Um, but one transporter room we know can do six beam outs at a time, and that takes five seconds. So now we're down to 16,000 so it's a little better, but we're still way oversaturated. We want to get that down uh, to 100%. So again, saturation 
is when utilization is near or at 100%. Your resources are overloaded. And this is something that is a exponential problem. So if your utilization is above 90%, the closer it gets to 100%, the more the queuing latency will be affected. Queuing latency is just how long it takes to process the next job in a queue. Um, this is, again, something we've already discussed. It takes five seconds to process a DMAP. And so when we talk about queuing latency, we're just talking about how long does it take to get to that next job. There's also a concept of queuing delay. And the delay is how long it takes to get that last transport done. And so in this case, uh, if we're just doing one transporter room at a time, it's going to be 833 seconds, so 14 minutes. So our queue delay is through the roof, we're oversaturated, and we're going to need to scale in order to get all of the crew members out in two minutes. So how do we go about figuring that out without everyone just stacking up and waiting in line. Well, again, you could just test, benchmark, scale up, test again, see how it goes. Um, but first, it's important to understand what parallelism is, right, versus concurrency. So parallelism is when two tasks can be completed simultaneously. So what we've been watching when they beam out is six at a time in five seconds. So that's a parallelism of six. Six can be processed completely at the same time. In software terms, that's using six cores at the same time, six Ruby processes at the same time to process things. So parallelism provides higher throughput. But concurrency doesn't always give us parallelism. And that's something that I think is a little trickier to visualize or, you know, at least think about in your head without having some numbers to back it up. So concurrency is really just when two things start at the same time, end around the same time, work is being done around the same time, but they're not being done simultaneously. So they're not being worked on at the same instant. This doesn't really work with my analogy, so we're going to skip that for now. <laughs> Vertical scale, right? Just bigger, right? A transporter with more pads, a ship with more transporters. You can think of this like a server with more CPU cores. And so little ship on the left, maybe it has four transporters. Big ship on the right, maybe it has eight, maybe it has 64. You can get big instances on AWS, but it's important to understand what are some of those uh, vertical scaling or horizontal scaling uh, considerations. And the concept of a scaling quantum, I really like the terminology here. It works with my Star Trek theme. But I uh, took that uh, from Nate Berkopec's book, which I will also be plugging in a later slide, Sidekick in Practice. Just did it there, we'll do it again. But a scaling quantum is how much utilization you're getting every time you scale horizontally. So if you're scaling the big ship horizontally, you're getting 64 more cores. You're getting 64 more transports. But if you don't have the offered traffic to support that, you may be overscaling and you're going to be costing a lot of money. You might not be paying that bill. You might be working for a big company, and they might not care as long as people don't have to wait for the services. But I am working for a pre-seed startup, and we are actually uh, looking at vertical scale for now because computer vision is hard, and we need an 8 GPU uh, server with 96 cores, and that's going to be deployed into a hospital it just got delivered today, actually. So it's water-cooled, rack mount, never worked with anything like that before. They're better than RTX 3090s. They're the Quadro A6000s. Again, 
very expensive. Having to have multiples of those and not utilize all of them would be a waste of money. They're like $100,000 each. So horizontal scaling. There are also other considerations, right? As we increase the number of ships or the number of instances, we can handle more traffic. But every time we increase uh, the number of ships or the number of instances we deploy, we got to think about how many connections we have available to our database, and we don't want to overwhelm the database connection pool. So we'll get into that a little more uh, without the Star Trek analogy soon. So stepping away from the Star Trek analogy a little bit, we'll talk about how parallelism and concurrency differ. So in this chart, we have three processes, let's say. Thread one and thread two are on the same process. Process one and process two are just separate instances of your Ruby application. Process one and process two work at the same time, so they complete in half the time on the chart. Thread one has to use all the CPU. There is no IO wait. There is just runtime. And thread two has to wait for that CPU on that shared process. And though, so you see, in this case, adding concurrency didn't actually add throughput. We got no parallelism out of adding threads. And this is because of the shared lock on the virtual machine for Ruby. So we talk about that. We talk about the Ruby VM. You often hear the GIL, the global interpreter lock, the global virtual machine lock, the GVL. What essentially is happening here is a queue, right? Your threads have to queue and wait their turn to access the virtual machine, which can handle one set of instructions in and out at a time. So while the virtual machine is in use, all of the other threads are idle. So how do we benefit from concurrency? Whenever a thread is not using the virtual machine, it's waiting. And when it's waiting, it's not doing work, unless it's doing something in C. So things like networking are implemented in C for C Ruby. So it's not actually going to use the Ruby virtual machine. So those threads in yellow could send off a request and wait, and then no longer block or lock the CPU that the process which created the Ruby virtual machine is using. So the next thread can take its turn in line, get access, and move on. So again, looking at this, they're not exactly the same. Having concurrency, you could potentially get partial parallelism. So we'll see an example of that next. In this, you see in yellow, IO wait. Again, that could be a network request where thread one starts processing a request, waits on the network response. When the response is back, it can do whatever Ruby it needs to maybe send a request back if it's a web request. Or if this is a background job, it could be downloading an image and then processing the image. Um, so thread two can actually pick up where thread one left off when it started waiting. And thread two can start its process, wait for its network request, wait for the IO to come back, and then process again. So what you see is it's not as fast as having a separate process, but we did save a little time. And so we got a fraction of parallelism with our concurrency in this circumstance. And again, this goes into queuing for the global virtual machine and thread locking. So we want to consider this when we consider increasing our concurrency. Increasing parallelism is a little more straightforward. It's just adding more ships to our fleet, it's deploying more servers, deploying more ships. And it obviously will increase parallelism because now we can have a separate instance of our application. You always have to be mindful, though, of your memory footprint because each process is going to load your Rails application into memory. So you want to make sure if you're 
vertically scaling and having multiple processes running on the same instance, that you actually have the space to do that. And now concurrency isn't free either. But uh, as we've talked about, the use cases for concurrency are whenever you're waiting on things implementing in C. So when you're waiting on network IO or disk IO, third-party API calls, database queries, Elasticsearch is basically just a third-party API. They're all just making some kind of IO wait happen. So how much concurrency? How do you decide how to turn up that knob and set and tune your concurrency options. And you could just blindly trust me, and I can tell you. But I think it's important to benchmark, optimize, and trust in your application performance monitor, whatever it is, whatever tells you where your processes are taking the most time, uh, and then test again. Uh, now, going back to uh, the idea of IO weight and concurrency providing you with partial parallelism, uh, I got this chart again from Nate Berkopek. Um, he blogs about this a lot. Uh, he has a great book, Sidekick in Practice. But this is a useful table that's derived from Omdahl's Law. And now I don't want to talk too much about theory because that's not what I do. But it's basically this calculation at the top that is the percentage of the time your job is waiting and the amount of concurrency, right? So dividing the amount of concurrency by the percentage of weight will give you the speed up benefit or the parallelism value. And so you can see here, if you're not waiting a lot, you don't want to have a high concurrency. When I started using Sidekick in 2012, I think the default concurrency was 30. The new default concurrency is 10. And that's really just to save people from making mistakes on raising concurrency, thinking it's just going to make things faster. When in fact, if you're doing a lot of uh, Ruby virtual machine CPU intensive work, uh, you're not really going to have any speed up past one concurrency. And uh, as your IO weight grows, so again, if you're downloading images, it actually might take a while for your background job to fully download that image. Your IO wait time might be 90%. And the rest of the time, you know, might be a, a quick image version that you're just cropping an image, for example. That might not take long. You could benefit from a higher concurrency of 32 where you would then, based on the calculation at the top, get a parallelism of eight. So thinking back to the charts that we were looking at, increasing concurrency when you have a high IO wait percentage, so the percentage of time that your request or job is waiting on something, it could be a web application request that's waiting on a long database query or doing something else that's not in Ruby, then you could turn up the concurrency. I'm just going to pause here, get the book. I've been working with Sidekick for over a decade, and this book has uh, really just helped solidify a lot of the things that I kind of just did. I did a lot of like testing and tuning and m measuring and measuring again, um, but just having the understanding of why practical things matter is really important. So for job queuing, um, we can do uh, distributed processing with our sidekick processes. Um, background jobs benefit from using Redis as a central queue. And one of the things that we should consider is latency-based queuing. So having queues that have similar job latency. So if a beam up takes five seconds, it should go into that five second queue and a sidekick process should focus on training that queue. Uh, this is again, more just about capacity planning so that you don't have long jobs blocking short jobs. We should also consider the IO wait time because we wanna balance those queues and their concurrency. So this is again, just a representation of that chart, but 
a concurrency of five could be for a queue that has 25% IO wait time and all the way up to 16 concurrency for 75% wait time. But there's also queuing in your web processes. So if you use Puma, uh, which I think you should, uh, Nate Berkopec is actually a maintainer of Puma, um, you will see in their architecture documentation that requests actually queue per process. So there is no centralized queue. There is no way to distribute the processing of requests in your queue. Only threads of that worker process will actually be able to drain that request queue. So you want to make sure that in this scenario, if you can afford it with your memory footprint, you actually have two worker processes, which gives you two queues for your request to be routed to. And that gives you a little more parallelism and the ability for your threads to operate on a request so that your users don't have to wait. Now, Heroku uh, has what they call intelligent routing, which they recently, for me anyway, I think it's been a while now, um, switched to random routing. So that means instead of checking uh, how many requests they've sent to a dyno, they'll just send it at random. And so your queues will fill up at random. And so again, you just want to make sure that you consider how many requests you're going to get and the fact that those queues are isolated from other processes and only the threads on those queues can process those requests. But it's always important to remember why we queue. And no, it's not for profit, but that is a benefit if you have customer satisfaction. And Customer satisfaction, a good user experience, is not having to wait. Waiting a long time makes us frustrated. Uh, things to consider are long wait times cause timeouts and rejections and denial of service. Heroku has, I think, a 30 second timeout. And after a request times out on your web application server, Rack will actually keep processing it because Heroku didn't tell Rack about that. So Rack has a timeout setting that you can set in a, uh, an environment variable. And it's something to consider having your Rack timeout be lower than your platform timeout, uh, just so your CPU cycles aren't wasted, because that's essentially processing an error, which I didn't make a slide for the E part of use, but I was just focusing on the utilization and saturation side. So waiting too long causes frustration. Uh, there are other queues. Queues are everywhere. Your system resources will have to queue. The operating system that handles context switching for concurrency causes queuing. So too much concurrency in any language, not just Ruby, not just things like Python that also have a global interpreter lock will queue. Database queries queue. If you send too many requests to a database that can't handle it, its resources will queue. Uh, there are other queues, like uh, videos are just queues of frames. Um, so in this video, uh, you can see that I recently proposed. And uh, yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you. And uh, you, you could say that I'm engaged. Um, so yeah, it's important to find balance with your scaling. Make sure you understand your utilization and saturation for your queuing both on the front end and the back end. Be mindful of your system resources, the footprint that your processes have, and also threads cause memory fragmentation. So if you're downloading a bunch of images, processing them, those threads aren't necessarily going to clean up themselves, and it could lead to memory bloat. But all good things must come to an end. So that's this talk. I appreciate it. And uh, one last thing, not just Gene Roddenberry for the inspiration, um, but my dad. Uh, my dad passed away earlier this year, actually. When I got uh, told that I had this talk accepted, I was in the ICU. And uh, I thought about canceling this talk. I didn't have slides prepared until this morning. Um, I had an outline, though, uh, but all the visuals you saw I did this morning. Um, but I thank my dad, and I thank all you for coming. Thank you.